You're listening to Conversation Balloons, interviews with experts and friends about how the generations can help each other thrive. I'm your host, Leah Farish. Check out this episode. Kristen Weiss has been a pioneer in the fight against child trafficking and exploitation since 2004. In 2013, she founded the Demand Project. Kristen is a private investigator, a state and local victim crisis advocate, and creator of such programs as VAST, Victim Advocate Support Team, the Alternative to Prison Program, and co-developer of the Journey to Freedom, non-residential and residential programs. Welcome to our little studio, Kristen. Thank you for having me. I understand you got to work with a national initiative a couple of years ago. Would you tell us about that? Yes, it was pretty exciting and such an honor. We were, um, Jason and I were nominated by Congressman Mullen and Senator Langford to be on the Public-Private Partnership Advisory Council to End Human Trafficking through the Trump administration. And prior to nonprofits being on this council, it had always been survivor-led. So this was the first time that 11 of us throughout the United States with nonprofits were able to be on this council. So what we did was we took prevention and restoration recommendations to the Congress and to the president's inner office task force agencies to show them some different ways that legislatively and through the states could make a real difference in this fight and not bound us by legislation but free us to go after those that are hurting children. So it was pretty amazing. We sunset after, and then we changed presidencies, and we have not gone any further since. Oh, that's unfortunate. It's so urgently needed. Yes. Well, as I anticipated your visit here today, I was thinking, I better do a good job because I am taking this woman away (laughs) from urgently needed work. I am taking an hour out of her life devoted to that's devoted to fighting child trafficking. And so we've got to justify this. And so listeners, I want you to consider this time, time that you're spending fighting child trafficking. And we want this conversation to move hearts and to move into pocketbooks and to volunteering and to Uh, sharing that sense of urgency um, and awareness that Kristen is so good at imparting. So you have four prongs in the work of your organization. Tell us about those. Yes. So when we started the Demand Project, we had already been working in this field for years, and we could see gaps. I mean, one of the biggest gaps was people didn't even believe that it existed. So that was the biggest hurdle to get over. That what They didn't believe that what existed? Human trafficking. Like, kids weren't sold for sex in the United States. Like, that happens somewhere else, but not here. And yes, it does look different in the United States, and it's buried, and it's hidden, and it's behind a lot of powerful people sometimes, or hidden behind trauma with children. But yes, it does happen here, and it happens in the United States, all 50 states, in Oklahoma, and in our own backyard right here in Tulsa. So it does happen here. And that was one of the hardest things to get out there. But we also saw gaps in, okay, so once there's awareness and education and that it is happening, what's what are people going to do about it? How are you going to protect these children? How are you going to prosecute the bad guys? Who's creating the demand? How are we going to recover these um, vulnerable, at-risk kids? And then what in the world does restoration look like with if you look at a ball of, of yarn, it's so tightly wound up. If you think of a one child being lured, groomed, being beat up, drugged, serial raped, raped, molested, all of these different crimes around them, it's like a tsunami of crimes wrapped in all of this, this tightly wound trauma. And how are we going to unwind that trauma? Like, what is that model? 
So that's why we started the demand project. So now we do prevention education, protection with the legal department, recovery, helping law enforcement and those in the system to help at risk kids and then restoration. Well, I, uh, I, I see that the magnitude of what you had to try to enter into. Um, so I want to hit on both of these and uh, unpack them a little more. The prevention project, that's what I thought of when I thought of the phrase, the demand project, and learned that it was about human trafficking. I thought, okay, it must be dedicated to fighting porn and sexually oriented businesses. Um, I didn't know much about human trafficking at the time. But um, is that something that you address? We do. Um, but we see prevention as our most important strategy because if we could prevent it on the proactive side, we wouldn't have to react in the protection, recovery, and restoration. Sure. So w one of our biggest things that we do is we have awaken, empower, and um, aware. And those presentations are Awaken is about human trafficking for adults to I, be able to identify it in their sphere of influence. Aware is a workshop for parents to teach online safety for their own children and children that they know or for teachers or people in a position of trust to be able to identify if a kid is being lured and groomed online. And then our empower is an assembly for kids themselves to go right to the kids that are on the front line that are the ones that need to know how to fight this for themselves, identify that somebody's trying to lure them into something. So as we fight for compliance and safety in businesses and churches and different people in the community, we go right to the parents, right to the schools, right to the kids themselves and teach and train them on what this looks like and how they can avoid it. Well, these are large, large topics, and I'm sure I would just love to have people hear each of these presentations in detail. But can you give our listeners a few points um, of awareness to hang on to as they try to be aware and think, what if I ever encountered someone who is being trafficked, how would I know it? Yes. So I like to start out by saying trauma does not start with trafficking. Trauma is usually something that happens in an individual's home, at school, um, around their friends, alleged friends, whatever it is, bullying or comparing. Think of children today. Think of how different it is that they have the world wide web at their fingertips. Think of a child walking into your home, your child walking into your home or into the school, and they've got this phone where they can literally talk to anybody in the whole entire world. Are they overly distracted with that phone? Are they defensive about that phone? Are they always wanting that phone right there with them? You can usually figure that there's a relationship being built on a phone or something happening in there that they don't want you to know about if they're getting defensive with that phone. If a person that you're around is constantly going to the bathroom with their phone or escaping around other people to get with their phone, there's something going on on there that you need to investigate if there's any way possible. So that's a personal tip for somebody is Watch and identify how close your kids are getting with those phones. Who owns those phones? I know in my home, I own the phone. So I get to tell where that phone gets stored at night and it's not in their bedroom. I get to decide how much time they want to be on that phone. And I can look on that phone anytime I want to look on it. Jason would often talk about, the other co-founder would often talk about how there are hidden vault apps on the phone, like a calculator. So if there's two calculators on a person's phone, it could be that there's a hidden vault app on there. So you can hide pictures and videos and communication in that 
calculator. No kid needs to, two calculators on their phone. They barely use one. And so <laughs> be, be, get to know your children, know what they're doing online. You wouldn't invite a predator into your home. So why are you allowing your child to take a predator up to their room on their phone? Mm -hmm. So identifying it in the community, you have to be aware. you got to get your head out of your own sphere of what you're doing and look around while you're driving while you're at a quick trip or a gas station, while you're in a store and start identifying how people are interacting with each other. Is there an older man with a younger girl that's dressed inappropriate, but he's dressed normal? Why is he with her? What time of day is it? Is it during school hours? How are they acting and relating with each other? Is there somebody rolling up in a van and getting out with all different ages of kids or people that are not dressed appropriately and they're all staying very close together. Is there somebody in the bathroom? Somebody just called me about a person that was on the floor of a bathroom. Looked like she was strung out on drugs. She knows me. She knows what we do. Tried to help this young girl. The girl goes outside with an older looking woman, female, very hardened looking female. And she could see that bond. She knew what was happening. Hmm. You just have to open up your eyes to it. Once you go through one of those three trainings I told you about, you'll start to see things and you'll start to realize there's something wrong here. And even if you're wrong, it's better to address it. Like I just went to church at on Easter and I happened to notice a mom screaming on her phone while her child was sitting next to her. And my son is like, let's go, let's go. And I said, no, we're at church. So I walk up to her car and I just tap on the window very carefully just to make sure everything is okay. Cause she's screaming with her daughter right there. And I wanted to console both and she sped away. But at least I walked over to the vehicle and carefully let her know somebody was there. Yeah. And maybe that would change something. Maybe not. But be aware of what's going on around you is the best thing that I can say. Mm -hmm. And I guess in, in the convenience store setting or something like that, getting the vehicle information is Use that key. phone. Take pictures, people. If you're somewhere and you think something shady is happening and you call law enforcement or me or someone and say, hey, I saw this guy with these girls in this car and they drove away. I'll say, well, can you describe the people? Can you describe the car? And you say, no, I don't know the make or model. I don't have the license plate and I don't know which direction they went. Nobody can help. So yes, thank you for bringing that up. Take pictures of the vehicle. Take pictures of the people if you can. Go to the security in the store. There's cameras everywhere. Maybe they could identify the vehicle if you didn't get it. But start to investigate in your own sphere of influence. But don't get yourself in an at-risk situation. Right. Be careful and discerning of the situation that you're in. At least try to get the tag if you At can't least. if you don't have your phone out or can't get it out quickly enough. Try to try to sing that tag number over and over and over until you can write that down. Yes. Um I've read something about a hand signal that people are publicizing for victims to indicate to a stranger I need help. Is that something you're talking about? Not yet, but I did just hear that that just came out. I don't know where that came from, but I love that it's an identifier. And if you do put that certain signal up, it lets them know that you're safe, they could be safe, or that they're at risk of being hurt. So I'm all for any anything like that to get out and us being a united community to help in preventing this from happening. Yeah. I think it's like the thumb folded across your palm and mm -hmm. then the fingers folded down over, over I think the so, thumb. yes. Are you seeing a connection um, between border security issues and an increase in trafficking? A lot. We have seen over the past couple of years that it has just ramped up with everything happening at our border and really losing kids like kids. They're just 
bringing kids into states and or people into states and letting them go or so people are bringing them over and you how do you identify who they belong to it's a very 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 dangerous situation we have not gotten any calls we put it out there that we have one of the largest campuses in the united states for minor children for restoration and we haven't had any calls that makes me more concerned than anything because i'm wondering why we're not getting calls are we not finding these kids are we not I mean, is there such a big problem that we have lost control over that completely? We know that there's a problem. You bring kids over that border unaccomp- uh, unaccompanied and what happens to them and where do they go and who takes responsibility or guardianship of them? And we're ready. We're ready to take kids. So I don't know what's happening with that. We've reached out to law enforcement and we haven't had any return calls. Well, and I would think that you would get <clears throat> big bumps in school enrollment if these are just children being brought in by family members who want a better life. But I don't believe we're seeing a huge bump in school in public school enrollment. Not hearing anything, not really understanding how so many are coming in and it's not affecting our whole social system in a different way and that we wouldn't be called because we know that there's an issue. So is it buried and we're going to find it? That's what I'm assuming. You you used a phrase, they're bringing in children. Tell us about the they. Who is bringing in these children from the southern border, at the southern border? So many times to get into the United States and because Who doesn't want to come to the United States? And to get into the United States, to get to a place where you can truly find freedom and find that independence and find that opportunity, um, a lot of families are looking for that. And a lot of families want their children to be raised in that so they can go to certain people that end up being human smugglers or human traffickers, which are two different crimes, but can... overlap each other, of course, and pay a certain amount of money or get indebted to these people, come over the border, and it's a bait and switch. And it was, we'll get you somewhere for this, but then it's all payback. And it's all, now we got you over here. And that's where labor trafficking and sex trafficking come into play. We don't often hear a lot about labor trafficking, but it's real. It happens all the time. So when you're coming over that border, it would be human smuggling or human trafficking to get them here. And then you have a whole entire different animal that those of us fighting in this battle have to address. These traffickers, the are they members of the the word I hear is cartels? Is that accurate? It can be can be gang related, um, organized crime, um, criminal ventures. It can be gangs. It can be, I want to get it back down to our viewers. It can be a mom that sells their kid for rent money. It can be a dad that starts out by grooming their child and getting that child to become a recruiter to find other people their age to help in this crew and then selling their own children. It can be a neighbor. It can be a friend at school. A lot of different stories of friends at school that will recruit and bring them into a trafficking scenario. So it can be organized crime, gangs, all these big organizations all the way down to in your own neighborhood, in your own community, there's something going on behind the, those closed doors. Because again, trauma does not start with trafficking. Trauma creates vulnerability. Vulnerability creates the opportunity for human trafficking. Mm-hmm. Let's go on to talking about protection. That's your um, next one. Pr- protecting victims once Uh, They have gotten on your radar, uh, for example, pursuing civil litigation. Um, If you, 
here's my dream scenario. We find a trafficker and we, we, we get this, get a hold of this cartel's ac- a- assets. And we get all its SUVs and we find a bank account and we find all this stuff and we go through civil forfeiture and Love we get that. $5 million. <laughs> yes. And then we get this pot of money and then the victims can sue them and, and get that money. But does that ever happen? <laughs> There is asset forfeiture for sure, but it has not happened to those of us that are fighting in this as of yet. That doesn't mean that we aren't trying to pursue that because think of a hotel that's allowing this to take place in their hotel and they're taking kickbacks for the, um, for the flesh of these children. Let's take that hotel and turn it into a restoration campus. Mm. Like, I love that idea. Let's let's make it a place that we can turn it into good. So, yes, love that. We have not done that yet, but our legal department is extremely unique to a 501c3 organization like the Demand Project. Most 501c3s don't have a legal department embedded within their organization. We knew how huge it was going to be, whether it's someone that has been brought over the border Now they're an illegal citizen and that illegal status is being used against them to keep them in human trafficking. Well, we will help them to become legal citizens in the proper channel, right? With law enforcement. Um, We had a kid here at East Central High School in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And there was a 19 year old kid in the school that was a recruiter in a gang that was getting these girls to get into his crew and showing the girls through violent acts, what would happen to them if they spoke a word of this and also threatening that illegal status that they were under in the, in the United States and able to create a very, a very rough situation for this young girl and she was only 15 at the time. So once our legal department got involved and we did get her family on a visa, it was a whole new world for them. Got them in basically a witness protection program of sorts that we have and got them into a new school system, new housing, the status that I said, the visa status, T visa status. It opened up a whole world for this family And normally you wouldn't be able to do that if you didn't have that legal department. And so it's exciting for us because you're not really supposed to arrest a traffic victim, throw them in jail for the criminalization that's happened to them because they've taken part in criminal activity because they've been criminalized, but they're still a victim. So instead, give them an alternative program, alternative to prison. And that's what we really try to focus on. And for domestic violence, you have the program through the attorney general's office where they get a new identity. They, they, you could, they can change like their social security. They can have their mail rerouted. Why not for human trafficking? So those are some of the things that we're working on with our legal department that will be so helpful because once a person gets arrested, as you know, they're under the system. And there's fines and fees and court hearings. And it's hard for someone that doesn't know how to take care of themselves to be able to take care of that system. That's where our legal advocates come in to play. It's a brilliant um, program that I think is ahead of its time. We're usually a little bit ahead of our time, but that's okay. I mean, what is a pioneer supposed to do? You got to do it somewhere, so... Um, I also read that your effort in this area involves helping uh, law enforcement and the judicial system to avoid re-traumatizing victims by the whole process of going through uh, even even uh, protective actions by the state. Uh, and what what do those re-traumatizations? Where do those happen in this process? It's so hard because when there's an operation to find victims of human trafficking, it's got to be law enforcement. Like you just can't go 
be a household that sets people up or you're the one that's going to get go to jail. Mm -hmm. Like who's to say what your intent is. So when law enforcement is trying to find victims or predators surrounding human trafficking, they're going to do arrests. And in those arrests, if you don't have a trained advocate there to help that victim, criminalized victim, they're going to be thrown in jail and they're going to be around other predatorial people. So what we offer is advocacy. That's why when you read my bio, I was a state and local ad or national advocate because it's so important for them to have a voice because they look like a criminal. They act like a criminal. I don't want to butter this up to make anyone listening think that a survivor of human trafficking is going to look like a weak, grateful, humble person that is so thankful for the help. I heard a quote once that said, um, a person in trauma is more, um, feels more comfortable with a, their familiar captivity than their unfamiliar freedom. Mm. That's a mouthful. So you could see that if trauma doesn't start with trafficking and there's been a vulnerability, and I'm not saying that it was bad parents, maybe they were great parents, but distracted parents. And maybe there was something going on at school with teachers, with coaches, with someone in their life, and they just didn't identify that something was going on. Um, that that vulnerability can cause the trafficking and the criminalization of this kid. And so you just, when a child runs away from something and ends up somewhere where somebody's saying they're going to take care of them, that becomes their familiar captivity because that person's going to take care of your basic needs. They're going to lure you and groom you, and they're going to make you think that they're the only one in the whole world that cares about you. And they're going to provide everything luring with love, grooming with love mm -hmm. and attention and, and affirming that person and then getting them addicted to drugs, this crazy life out there, making them think that think that they're controlling their world. They're actually choosing to do this. That becomes a familiar captivity. So then bringing them out of it, we're bringing them into an unfamiliar freedom mm -hmm. and it feels very uncomfortable. So the whole system that puts them into this unfamiliar freedom over here, like say they get out of the, the system, say we help them get out of the system and we walk them through the hopefully stopping them from being re-traumatized throughout the system and we get them into a safe place. They're going to rebel. They're going to rebel if we don't teach as we go, mm -hmm. if we don't put them with safe people, if we don't give them a structured um, loving program for the, them to be in for a long-term time. So you've got a lot of re-traumatizing throughout the whole thing. There's a lot of mental health that goes along with this. And if you just drug up kids, if you just try to stop this with giving them a lot of medications, that's a problem as well. So from being in jail, over-medicated, thrown into a program and told what to do, there's a lot of things that can happen in there where the kid is like, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm running back. And they keep going back. And we're all like, why are you going back? Going but, back to a trafficker? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Seems mind blowing to the average person. But if they're not being taken care of to their satisfaction outside of it, they'll just go back to what they know. That's and yeah, thing. their locus of control has shifted to that pimp or trafficker or whatever. Yes. They don't have their own and haven't for maybe a few years. No. Yeah. But they still think they have control. Right, right. But they don't. So they want to go back to captivity, even though we're saying, hey, over here, we're going to help you get independent and get your, get your, get your freedom back. But they're not seeing it that way. So... 
there's so much traumatiza- or trauma, traumatizing and re-victimizing all the way down from the courts to the mental health to the programs. It's a lot to maneuver through. And that leads us to the restoration prong. And yes. tell us about what you do. So the, we never wanted to be a campus or a facility or shelter. It was a lot of liability, a lot of work, a lot of extra um, time, money, resources. How, what are, how are we going to do this? Like with everything else that we're doing in, in the other areas, how are we going to do this? I just wanted to do the recovery and help law enforcement, help the legal system, help probation, help DHS, help the de- detention center. I just wanted to help and facilitate resources that could help because I'm very good at doing that. I'm very creative at finding resources and helping in that process. And that's what I really wanted to do. In 2017, God changed everything. And we were donated um, 54 acres, nine buildings that used to be a children's home. And we turned it into one of the largest campuses in the United States. So we house 11 to 17 year old minor girls. It's a two year, two year program. We use mentors, therapists, and case managers. We teach life skills. Um, It's more of a residential setting. So it's not like it's a facility. It's a campus. It, it houses people kids that have been through some nine, 10 programs in and out of mental health hospitals, kids that have banged their head against walls to get out. They come to our campus and it's amazing the difference in a residential program, but it's definitely not for someone with pervasive aggressive behavior or sexual deviancy. That wouldn't fit our program because we are more residential style. So we can take a level E kid. That's just a DHS term, like the highest level of traumatized kid. But if they act out in a a pervasive, aggressive way, we couldn't take them. So we also do a non-residential program. So we didn't want to just fit in this box of just doing non-residential or residential. We wanted to help any gender, any age, anywhere. We'll take kids from anywhere in the United States Mm -hmm. residentially, but we'll also help anyone that we can help by facilitating resources. Oklahoma has a lot of good legislation and we have a lot of wisdom because of the work that people like the Demand Project and Shared Hope and Polaris Project and all these other organizations have done over the years and years and years. And Oklahoma would be ahead, but we're not ahead in building capacity. We only have two adult shelters that are certified to take in human traffic victims because you have to be certified. And between them, they have about probably 18 beds. And then there's one about to open here pretty soon, but that's it in the whole state. And then for minor kids, we have one in Idabel, Oklahoma, that takes state custody kids, one in Muskogee, and us, and that's it. So we need to build capacity. We need more campuses, more shelters, more transitional living for kids that are aging out. How do they take that next step? How do they become independent, free people that can feel proud of what they're doing and not run back to a horrific solution to a problem? We don't want that to happen. Right. So we need to build capacity. You you have some you have some graduates of your program though, right? We do, we do. And And they are doing doing? fantastic. I mean, we have the bad stories too, where They went through, we were able to help them for a minute, and now some are lost, but some are doing great. They just may not be with us anymore, and that's fine. They don't need to stay with us. So we have some wonderful, um, amazing stories. One of the kids just wrote us a letter to um, to all the volunteers and all of the team that has been helping her. It made us all cry before I came on this podcast because 
what she was saying was, I never knew freedom because it was her mom that was the one that was the drug addict and sold her daughter for drugs. But the letter came at such a perfect moment for all of us. And it it defined how she never found freedom until now. She thought that we were going to bring her up to this campus and at any minute we were going to be bad guys and and try to get something from her because nobody had ever been with her that didn't require something of her. And so she didn't know how to act because every day went by and there was nothing. We're like, this is for you. And so she just came to the realization that for the first time in her life, she had an unfamiliar freedom and she felt safe for the first time. And it's just amazing. I also want to say that just because this particular kid, it was her mom, and we see that a lot, that it's a familiar situation, a person of trust. I'm telling you with these phones and technology, the first time my daughter saw male uh, genitalia was on the school bus in elementary school from another person's phone. So no matter what we did, because we did, she didn't have a phone, because why did she need a phone? But this other kid had a phone and decided that he would share pornography with her. So I just want to say to anybody listening, it's not just the mom selling the child. It's the child and the parents being distracted, the child creating relationships, virtual relationships right under your nose and building this 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 relationship while mom and dad are being how they're supposed to be in strict and telling them to do things. You got a predator over here saying, oh, those parents, they don't understand you. Come over this way. Meet me over here. Mm -hmm. So be very careful. It happens in mm -hmm. most households. Wow. That exposure that, that we don't even know about. We don't but even it know. can be a very defining experience in yes, their life. And children are, are generating their own porn now. Thank you for I mean, saying that. They are one of the highest makers of developing child porn by selfies mm -hmm. and sexting those selfies to someone else's distributing child porn. And then that child that views it is viewing child porn. Mm -hmm. And it's an endless cycle. So some college students, my nephew actually was telling me that some girls in his college, that's their side hustle to make money through college is to sell pictures. So what you sell is a piece of you every time. Mm -hmm. That child thinks that they're just selling something to one person. Can I just be blunt? You're becoming a masturbation tool for a predator. Mm -hmm. Is that really what these girls are thinking about when they're doing that? Probably not. Mm -hmm. They're just looking for a buck. There's a lot of other ways to do it because those pictures never go away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and um, some people think, you know, they're vanishing chats now. and But you can take a screenshot of something that you think is going to vanish. Yes, ma'am. The, the receiver <laughs> can, and it's out there. Forever. To a million people forever. Yeah, and when you hear about these arrests that happen and some child predator was arrested with however many thousands, hundreds of thousands of images and videos. Well, your child may be one of them because of the selfies that they're taking, the sexting that they're doing. There's an, there's also a term called sextortion where you send a picture to someone and then they start to threaten you and say, if you don't send me more, I'm going to send this out to your church people, your family, your, tell your school, parents. tell yeah. your parents. Mm -hmm. And so that's another way of getting images for bad guys to get images from good kids. Maybe they made one mistake and they didn't, they weren't going to make that mistake again. And here's this threat. So that's very, very scary. But it's a conversation with your child. Set them down and tell them about things that are going on. Open up to your children. Don't worry about being embarrassed about the topic of sex, because if you're not going to address it with your kids, somebody else is going to. And where do you want them to get their wisdom from? You and prevent something from happening 
or from somebody else that wants to lead them down a very bad and dangerous path. Hmm. So the child's, the average age of a child who is groomed would be what? Probably right around the 11, 12 year old age is where it's really starting to happen. I would say it's getting younger because parents are giving their kids phones younger. You know, you you really can't be on social media until you're 13 years old. That's kind of the standard age that apps give you to be able to be on, on have their apps downloaded on your phone. So I don't really know why parents are doing this younger and why you why you're starting your kids on a worldwide platform at that age anyway. It's hard enough to control and contain the atmosphere of your children without the World Wide Web. It's impossible if you bring it into your home. Mm-hmm. You you can't know what they're looking at and they're scrolling so fast. It's like they're things are feeding them so fast these days, images and mm-hmm. They're seeing things so young. You just have to be very, very, very careful. Because if it's 11 to 12 years old for luring and grooming a kid and it gets younger, what if it goes to nine years old? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to lose generations if we're not careful. And all, all of this age group, you know, if they were acquired, if they are, are, uh, actually um, enslaved in this, this is an age where they can't drive. They can't get away. Right. They don't have the judgment to even figure out what they could possibly do, even if they get an opportunity. So there, it really is slavery, isn't it? It really is. I mean, it's, it's such control and manipulation that you get a child l- early enough, you have them long enough, they start to think that they're a willing person. And like you said, they don't have the ability and the tools to get out of it. So what can they do? And where most of the people that we work with say, where would we have gone? I mean, they're not just usually keeping you in the, the neighborhood of where your, your parents are or where you were, so how are you supposed to get back to that? And what are you going back to? What is the um, age that a victim is discarded? I mean, is there some end of this tube that they're put into? Or, or do they die in this if they don't escape? That's a very good question. Most people don't ask that question. Um, I have heard that there could be a span of about seven years that a person can endure such um, horrific crimes against them. I once asked a person that we were working with, I said, it can't possibly be 20 to 25 people a day that you have to have sex with because our bodies can't manage such overwhelming trauma. And she said it, depended on the type of sex that they were performing. So I understood it a little bit different, that it wouldn't always be the same way. So I kind of understood that a little bit better. Um, If they don't die, and if they are able to get through, it's usually them finally taking that step to run away, or somebody helping them to get away. Every time, every time it's been that scenario with us that we've seen. Um, And so it's either a person that was buying them or a person that saw something happening to them that said, this is not okay and helped them to get away or a tip to law enforcement, or it was them finally deciding, I can't do this anymore. And I would say that's when the body is telling you, it can't do this anymore. Your body cannot maintain that level of trauma. Now, let, let me shift over to um, looking at who the traffickers are based on your experience. Who are these people? I mean, <laughs> I've been 
trying to prepare for this interview, just telling myself they're not monsters. It's not helpful to think of them as monsters that won't get a problem solved. I, I just have trouble just not dismissing them as some cipher that's like some cartoon villain, but they are human beings also. Who are they? How do they get into this as a business? And is there any hope for them? I think everybody has their different opinion on if there is hope for a person that would do this. And um, as far as a trafficker goes, a trafficker is a businessman, an opportunist. I wouldn't say businessman, a business person, an opportunist, a person that has gotten to the place in their life. And I'm sure there was trauma with them as well. I would... I have not gone into the prisons and done interviews, which I would love to do. And it's not that that won't come someday. But um, from what I understand from the people that we serve and what they say is that it was an opportunity. They were an opportunity. They were being, they thought that they were in love with them. The trafficker loved them. They thought that they were taking care of them, that they were the person in their life that rescued them from whatever life they had prior to, even if it didn't seem like a bad life, that they're kind of their hero. And so it's a business person or it can be a family member. So that's complicated if it's a family member selling their own child or their niece, nephew, whatever it is, um, that gets very complex in that. So it's a person that is all about the business. It's just about the business. It's a person to get them to a place that they want to be financially. And and there are tiers of these people. So there's probably a kingpin who really doesn't get his or her hands dirty with it day to day anyway. And then there are a couple of levels to the business there can be like you've got gangs that are doing this you've got cartels you've got organized criminal elements doing this and then you've got a household level a community level where there's something problem there's a problem in the community that this is happening but yes there's different levels of it i would also want to talk about who is buying them if you don't have somebody buying a kid a person, a human being for sex, there wouldn't be a problem. There wouldn't be a problem at all. So you got the business person opportunist. You've got a victim that's been criminalized, but still a victim. Who is creating the demand, which is why we're called the demand project. Who is that key person in all of this that's buying people for sex? And that's why there's so many operations right now online to go after online predators, because there are predators out there, like endless amounts. And they're all different people from the highest level in government, in community, in status, financially, all the way down to just the low level pervert, child predator that wants to be with a kid. So there is, when Jason was doing a lot of these um, online investigations in the past, he would tell me stories about, he'd be chat, this person would think that they were chatting with a 14 year old little girl online. He chatted with a teacher right in the middle of him teaching class. He could see from the computer that there were kids in that classroom while he was chatting with the same age kids in the classroom and being sexual with this 14 year old, he talked to a a built millionaire owner, a CEO of a company. The guy would leave the office, go out into the car, chat with this little girl, do what he did and then go back into the office. He had a predator once that was just a, just a young man, just a young guy And he was so addicted to 
child pornography, that he didn't leave his computer screen. He had a place to go to the bathroom right there, a place to put out his cigarettes, his his food, drinks all around him, just at his computer. It's such an addictive behavior. And it's, I, I would say if you are a believer, it's the most demonic thing because pornography is just a seed that's planted that grows into something so pervasive to buy a person for sex, to abduct a person for sex, to put a person in your basement or in a room and lock them away for sex because you're not going to continue forever just looking at pornography. It will have to come. It will have to grow or die. There's no other place for it to go. So when you get to the point of buying a person for sex, you have crossed way over that line. That's the person I don't know if they can be redeemed. The trafficker is a business person. Yeah, they're raping these people as well. Yes, but they're doing it for a different reason. They're the, en- they're the ends to what they're trying to get. They're trying to make money off of a person. But the person buying... You're talking about the customer. The customers, mm-hmm. the demand creating it. Mm-hmm. Can they be healed? I don't know. I don't know. I have not had anyone tell me that they can be healed. My goodness. Yes. Oh, my. So there has to be a switch at some point with looking at pornography and even going to prostitution for sex to buy a person. There has to be a switch to go from an adult to a child. I'm not so sure that once you switch, you can come back. That is deep. That's deep. And that's what's happening to our men and women out there. There's a switch and there's so much available online now. You don't have to go to the seedy porn shop in your in your town or neighborhood. You don't have to go there anymore. You don't even have to go to the strip club. You can sit in the comfort of your living room and see whatever it is you want to see. And when it goes all the way down from an adult to a child to an infant, I don't know if you can come back from that. I pray that you can. But that is not what I hear. Right. We do know from studies that the prognosis for a a child molester, not just not a commercial transaction, but just a molester is is very poor. Exactly. They they are huge recidivists. So let's go all the way to a buyer of children for sex and someone that is selling child pornography to a whole network of child predators. Can you come back from that? I don't know. You'd have to have a Damascus moment in my mind. I've read a, a study that um, of jurors who had been exposed to pornography, they tended to give lighter sentences for rape than jurors who did not consume pornography. And uh, so that makes me think that there is a, a desensitization and a, a connection to violence, a callousness that begins to set in just when you look at pornography, not even just violent pornography, but uh, that commodification of people, the impersonalness of it m- makes you a more opportunistic, uh, cynical um, person and does something to one's sexuality. It's I very dangerous. Agree. Very dangerous. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a life sentence to go that far. I mean, to, for a human being to go all the way down to looking at a child that we're supposed to protect. We're the ones that are supposed to be there to make sure nothing happens. And then you become the creator of evil in their life. You've just crossed that line. And I don't know. I hope they can come back from that. I don't know if a trafficker can. There there are are traffickers that are famous today. There are pimps that are famous today that are out there in 
Hollywood. In Hollywood, <laughs> on TV, hanging out with the Martha Stewarts. There's professed pimps and traffickers out there that are famous. Why? Why? I don't understand. I know that Snoop Dogg just came to Oklahoma and performed. I was very upset about that. I don't understand. He's a professed pimp. Why is he being glorified? I, I have a line. I have a line. And, it, and, and I hope everybody listening has a line. And I hope we don't forget that line. I have read of people in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, and other in Central America countries who run orphanages and manage to sell some of the children or most of the children for sex trafficking. And uh, certainly I, they and families who, in, in Haiti, there are many people who actually bring a, a child of their own to an orphanage, uh, just saying, I can't take care of the child. They're not orphans. The parents are not dead, but they they decide to contribute one child to this or to a you know someone who's involved in some kind of commercial enterprise that they say i've got four other children i've got seven other children i'm going to sacrifice one so that i can feed the rest i think this goes on in india and other places where there's abject poverty large families where uh, I think, you know, there's a calculation made, and, and certainly the orphanage, maybe they think, okay, we, we have a business here. We hope they go on to, they always, in Haiti, they always say Miami, that, that, Miami, that, that just means America, you know. Hope they get to Miami and have a better life. I don't really want to know. I'm not going to hear from them anymore. This little five-year-old girl, you know, America's a wonderful place. That's all I want to think about. And I'm wondering if there is a kind of shuddering of the eyes, of a kind of of the heart to the next step. Um, surely some families know this child could end up in a desperate situation, but they're facing a desperate situation. And, and then the, the next stage, the, the coyote or the person who, who gets them over the border, who gets them here and into the stream of traffic, maybe they don't let themselves think about what happens. They say, all I do is deliver these people and wish them well. And then the ones who actually put these kids in the, you know, a room in the back of a bar or a, put them onto a van to take them to Minneapolis or whatever. They think, well, you know, I'm just transporting them. I'm not really doing anything wrong. They're already here and I need the money. And it, it seems like there is a lot of rationalization that happens along the way that I'm just trying to challenge myself to go, is there anything that I do in my own life where I trade off and use people? Not to this extent, but I, I want to see that place where this person was a human being right before they, they became this horrible villain so that I don't do that you know, maybe to a lesser extent, maybe not. Is there any way that I'm, for example, making children stumble? Jesus said, it would be better that a millstone be tied around your neck than you make one little child stumble. Um, am I supporting, you know, something in the arts or in Hollywood that is, I know isn't good for children, and yet I pay for it? Is there maybe just at the molecular level some way that I am a hypocrite? I would say back to the Haiti part. There in India, there's such a culture, cultural difference, right? That's what you were talking about. It's such a cultural difference. And we have to understand that when we look overseas at different places. It's so different than America. 
the same things happen in America in a different package, a different form. I would say we all have our own duty and obligation to know what we're watching, who we're watching. Our, my daughter just had to watch the the pianist. I think that's what it was. And I was very angry that they showed that film at school because it's in a high school, local high school here. And I was very angry. And I'm like, I don't want you to watch that movie because the, the person that did the movie is a child predator that fleed America, went over to Europe, and he was honored at one of the award ceremony ceremonies. And I'm just wondering why we're honoring someone that was should have been a convicted person child predator. Um, I know that there's famous people out there that I love their acting, but I sure don't like what they do. I don't know why we're glorifying football sometimes when some of the players in football do these most horrific things, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's rape, whether it's drinking and driving, whatever that is, but it just gets pushed away. There are so many things that we can all do. If you're going to stand out there and pay money to go watch a sporting event, which I love to do, and you're going to hoot and holler and cheer and act crazy and do all and put all this money out there, maybe you could help those of us that are fighting against all of this as well. Maybe we could find a balance. Yeah. Maybe we could see where our products come from are, is there child labor trafficking going on with the products that we use? We try our hardest at the demand project. I'm sure we fail as well, but once we find out we're failing, we do something about it. And that's all we can say to viewers is watch what you're, where you're putting your time and your money and your resources. Is it helping or hurting? Are you furthering the mission to stopping this or are you creating another avenue to continue it? Well, I just think that leads me to a great call to action, which is how can people find you and how can they contribute to your efforts at the Demand Project? So they can go to the demandproject.org. That's our website. And there are so many ways to get involved. I could take as much time that we just did talking about all this on how people could help. Um, right now, we have on campus 54 acres and nine buildings. Unfortunately, I mean, we got a lot of things up there donated. All the toilets, all the beds, the bedding from Maloof. We got... Grigsby donated carpet. Like there's been so many people, Dow Tile donated tile, but we now have eight homes with carpet, but no vacuums that work. We would love to have more vacuums, but we need people to vacuum. So we have work days. We have work days out there where we want to build more buildings. Um, we have a water project going out there. We lost our well. So we had to pipe into the rural water district and it has been creeping up to a $100,000 project, and it's still not over. We have to rent the excavators, rent equipment, lay pipe. We have one campus maintenance manager that has this burden on his shoulders. And um, when we have work days, we get people out there to help us to work, which are phenomenal. We have an um, office in Tulsa that we always need help there. We have an expansion office we need work done to. We just got broken into last night. Oh yes. Yeah, so just replacing a door today and locks and stuff. We need people to be mentors in direct care. We need good therapists that are trauma informed and understand PTSD and all of these different um, things that happen to these kids and how to unravel this. We need case managers, which we call resource links, that help them find resources. We need two house guardians on campus. So we look at the whole entire world and all however many billions of people, and we need two house guardians, and we can't find two house guardians. We need a campus coordinator to come out to campus, marketers. Um, we just had volunteer week where we were celebrating our volunteers and took them out for ice cream, did Zumba, and Friday we're going bowling. We love our volunteers. We can't do what we do without people like you 
fighting it right here at the mic, out there at the campus, here in the office. We need p- time, money, and resources from people. All right. So they go to the demand project. Dot org, and it's under what you can do, and that takes you to all different ways that you can get involved. Well, I hope every listener does, and I really thank you for your time, Kristen. And uh, thank you to our producer, Caleb Broker. And uh, listeners, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to Conversation Balloons. Look for more episodes and information at leahfarish.com. That's L E A H. F-A-R-I-S-H dot com. And follow me on Facebook and Instagram. 